I, you know, I, I just I love the way you worship today. I, I've kind of just been looking over my shoulder uh, as we've been singing and uh, the way you you participated and um, and I love the fact that our children get to be with us. Mar Marissa pointed out to me just a moment ago when we were all praying together how the children were participating. And one of those girls came and sought me out. And so I had her color, you know, the color card, and she came to me and, and wanted to pray with me. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I appreciate the way you, you worship. Me. And I, I wonder, I, I, I want to look at myself and say, uh, if a child watches me worship, how what would they learn? You know, let, let's let's worship in a way, not just put on a show. But let's worship in, in a way that expresses uh, to the children around us and to one another the, the, the glory of the Lord, the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Uh, we've been in the, in the Beatitudes these past few weeks and. And last week I learned my lesson. I went back and reviewed and reviewed and then didn't really get to the point that, 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 as much as I wanted to. So today I'm not going to review so much and I hope you'll go back and look at the Beatitudes that we've already been looking at. And I want to remind you though that these are not individual statements. These are that stand alone. They're not like some of the Proverbs. You know, you read a proverb and... And, and, and then it, the next proverb in the book of Proverbs kind of doesn't connect with that last one. But in this, they all interconnect. These are the birthmarks, as someone has said. These are the birthmarks of, of, of the, the person who comes into the kingdom of God. The person who is born again. Remember, you can't come into the kingdom unless you're born again. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of, of heaven. Jesus said. It is so important that we not try to take shortcuts here and that we not try to be these things that it's talking about here just with our, within our own strength and our own abilities or because that sounds like a good thing to be. Because the only way you can be these things is by the new birth. The work of Christ in your life. Now the one of these Beatitudes that someone would most want to mimic would probably be the one that we're looking at today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now I mean, we kind of, that's one of those things that we would kind of hold up in high esteem. Peacemakers. Someone who brings peace into a situation. Or even, you know, that this past week we saw John McCain uh, and, and all the honor that was was brought to this person. And, and despite the fact that John McCain was a warrior, in, in many respects, he was a peacemaker. Now, very, in, in very secularized ways, not, not in ways that necessarily honor Christ. But we hold somebody like that in high esteem. But, and, but, but we need to understand that to be a peacemaker, you must first walk through each one of these, and all of these are interconnected. And we're going to see that as we go through this process today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now on your handout, you have each of the points that we've made all the way through. So point number seven. Point number seven. Join with Christ your King in His great work of bringing peace in a warring to a warring world. If somebody were to ask you to describe Christianity and what the Gospel brings to us when we repent and put our trust in Jesus Christ, the word that would probably be used is salvation. To repent and believe brings salvation. And that would be absolutely true, of course. But in one, of the way, one of the greatest ways we can express that is what comes to us when we repent and believe and put our trust in Jesus Christ is peace. That God brings peace. That being justified by faith alone in Christ alone, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That the Apostle Paul described the Gospel as the Gospel of peace. That we who are at war in so many respects as we're going to see, can now be brought to peace. 
So Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peacemaking has to do with our life direction. The change in life direction for those who come into the kingdom of God. And Jesus has made peace between us and God. And now peace is our mission. That we are called to be peacemakers. And so I want us to come face to face with some things today. If we're going to really get the full grasp of what this is talking about and the full force of what Jesus is saying to us here, there are some things we need to come face to face with. And, and much of this is going to involve looking in the mirror as much as we all love to do that, right? To look in the mirror and come face to face. And the first thing we need to come face to face with is with the war inside us. Come face to face with the war inside you. You know, I think all of us realize that there's something churning inside of us a lot of times, right? Some of us kind of put on a front better than others and, and we kind of cover that up. You know, you look at somebody and you say, that person seems to be at peace with himself or at peace with herself. Or we say, comfortable in your own skin, right? But the fact is, that every one of us, apart from Jesus Christ, are at war. And the, the greatest war is the war inside. Albert Einstein won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1921, said this in 1948 after the atomic bomb had been dropped on, on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. And Einstein said these words, Nuclear warfare is not a physical problem, but an ethical one. What terrifies us is not the explosive force of the atomic bomb, but the power of the wickedness of the human heart. It's explosive power for evil. And that's one time that the physicist and the theologian agree. Right? James said this in the book of James we read what causes quarrels and causes fights among you and, and some of you say well it's my husband or my wife right no no it's it, 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 what we find here it, is it not this that your passions are at war within you you desire and you do not have so you murder you covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, that's a picture of what's going on in our culture all around us, isn't it? I mean, someone loses a video game and comes back in with a gun. Or someone gets snubbed at school and comes in and kills the ones who snubbed him or her and everybody else that gets in the way as well. And I mean, those are just symptomatic, folks. Those are just outward expressions of the war inside of us. The Apostle Peter wrote, Beloved, I, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. That there's, again, there's something at war, something churning inside of us as human beings. The Apostle Paul, and this is not on your screen, at one point the Apostle Paul describing his own life said, I know the right things I ought to do, but I don't do them. I know the things I shouldn't do, but I do them anyway. Wretched man, he said, that I am. Who will deliver me from this bondage of death? What is he describing there? The war inside of us. Jesus Himself said in, in Mark chapter 7, what comes out of a person is what defiles Him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and 
And these are what the violence. Again, the Apostle Paul said, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, which is just being at, at odds with everybody around you. Strife, jealousy, bits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do not who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, this is a picture of us as humankind. And we don't like to think of it like that. And we try to highlight, I mean, I watch the news programs where they always end the program with some nice thing somebody did. Right? And, and I mean, that's all great, and we talk, we celebrate the human spirit. The fact is, in the garden, we went to war, and the war was inside of us first. That we desired, we wanted what we wanted when we wanted it. And in this, we found ourselves at war inside. But you know, that war inside of us also says that we've got to come face to face with our war with God. Because the fact is, and, and somebody's going to argue with me here in your mind, you're sitting there arguing, you say, I've never felt like I was at war with God. I might be indifferent toward God. I might be apathetic toward God. But I don't see myself as being at war with God. And most people would probably say that. Most people would probably argue that. The fact is, the Bible is a record of down through the ages, the warfare between humankind and the God who created them and put them in a garden, in a good place, who turned and rebelled against the One who created them and gave them all the blessings He could give. In, in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, we read, the mind that is set on the flesh... That is, that, that part of us that wants what we want when we want it. The mind that is set on, on the flesh, we read, it, it is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot submit to God's law. Which tells us this is not something we can fix ourselves and we can't do. So we can't just, just turn this around by self will. There is something inside of us that is broken and is irreparably broken that we ourselves can never fix, that can never turn around. And that something inside of us, the flesh, that part of us that makes us at war with ourselves, within ourselves, also sets us against the very God who created us. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read with, uh, of those who, who, who have not come to Christ. And, and it says they are following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the, of the air. Not following the king of, of the new kingdom, but the king of the world, the kingdom of this world. The Spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. One of the best ways for me to just say to you, to, to prove to you you're at war with God, whether you believe it or not, is just have God ask you to do something you really don't want to do. Something that, that you, you I mean you've got it in your mind you want you want to turn right and God says no turn left. Right. And at that point, or something in your life doesn't go the way you thought it ought to go. And all of a sudden you come face to face, face to face with someone who is at war with God. I think about Abel and, the, uh, Abel and Cain in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned against God and they had these two sons, Cain and Abel. And, and, and one Cain, of course, turned up away from God. Abel seeking to turn toward God. And we read, listen to what it says, the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Abel brought an offering to God as God told him to bring the offering. 
But, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. And I think what we deduce there is that Cain brought an offering the way he wanted to bring the offering, the offering he wanted to bring, not the offering God wanted, but the offering Cain wanted to bring. I mean, we, we say, you know, I do good things for God, but I do them in my time, if I'm honest, in my way, when I want to, as I want to. And listen to what it says. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And that's a picture of every one of us folks. At war with God. <clears throat> but, but, but God, this is the offering I want to bring. And this is the way I want to bring it. That's really a picture of religion. I'll bring an offering, but I'll bring it in my time, in my way, the way I want to bring it. And so we find ourselves at war. God says do something, but in our pride, we say, but that seems beneath me, God. That seems, that, that, that would, I would have to humble myself if I come in the way that you're requiring me to come. I thought about it, it ran through my mind as I was studying this about a man, a man by the name of Naaman. It's kind of an obscure story in, in 2 Kings chapter 5. And it, was, it took place in the time of Elisha. And, uh, and Elisha the prophet, they, it was known that he could heal people, that God worked powerfully through this man, Elisha. And Naaman was a Syrian general. Not, not of Elisha's people, a Syrian general, but he heard that this man Elisha could heal people, that God worked powerfully through Elisha, and Naaman had found himself with leprosy. Now, leprosy was a, was a fatal disease in that time. It was a, and it was a long, hard, terrible death. Naaman heard Elisha could heal. He did what, probably what anybody would do. He said, Naaman's a general. He's an important person. Tell Elisha to come and heal me. They went out, took word to Elisha. Elisha said, tell Naaman to come to me. Well, obviously, as we see in the story, Naaman didn't like it. But he came anyway. And we read, beginning verse 9, you'll see on your screen. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now, I want you to think about it. here, this important man. I, horses and chariots. I mean, this is like pulling up in a limo. You know, he's pulling up in front of the prophet's house in a, in a limo. And, and, and I'm an important person, is what he's saying here. And, and Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha didn't even go to the door. He didn't even go outside to meet him. He sent a messenger to him say, saying, go and wash in the Jordan. That would have been a Jewish river, right? And, 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 and do it seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. And he went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. I thought he would do it the way I... I thought he would do it. I mean, I'm an important person. He's asking me to go down to this little creek and, and dip seven times. Or, or, and then he says, Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, these are rivers in his own country close by, aren't they better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. Now, what a picture of, of us, right? Save me, Lord, the way I want you to. Save me, Lord, but let me keep my dignity. Save me, Lord, but let me be who I want to be as I want to be it. Heal me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. In my time. In my way. By my definition. But it says there were some people who had the courage to come to this very poor man and confront him. So his servants came to him and they said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? 
So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. He humbled himself. Now, if we look at the Beatitudes, he became poor in spirit. He became poor in spirit. He realized, you know, I can't set the agenda here. I'm a desperate person. You know what? Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no there's no greater desperation than a person who is apart from Jesus Christ. And so he went down, he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. What a picture of you and me. Not until we come to Him poor in spirit can we enter the kingdom of heaven. But the Bible shows us that history is the record of our unrelenting effort to get God off our back and to be able to do it the way we want to do it when we want to do it. And folks, when we come face to face with this and we understand how poor in spirit we are, then blessed are those who mourn that they shall be come. Blessed are those who realize how desperate they are and who feel it to the depths of their being and who no longer say to God, God, do it my way when I want You to do it. God, I, I, I want You to save me. I want You to heal me. I want You to fix my life. I want You to fix my marriage. I want You to fix my relation. I want You to get me a job. I want You to this. I want You to that. I want You to the other. I want You to do it the way I want You to do it. In the timing I, how I want You to do it in. But God says, you're going to have to come to me broken, humble, when those, that, that person who humbles himself before the Lord, the Scripture promises will be exalted. Folks, when we come face to face with the fact that we are at war within ourselves and we are at war with God, then we are beginning to wake up. It, 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 to spiritually, we are beginning to spiritually wake up. And this is when God can do what God only God can do in your life and mine. This is when God can heal Naaman. The Naaman in you and the Naaman in me. And so come face to face with God's answer. See, the, the other side of the coin is that God had become our enemy. Not only were we enemies against God, but God in His, in His righteousness and in His holiness became enemies with us. That, that God banished the man and the woman from the garden. And He put a guard over the garden. You can't do this the way you want to do it when you want to do it. I and I alone am God, He says. You can't come to Me at your own whim. You can't come to Me on your own rules and on your, in your own way unless you're willing to humble yourself. Come like a little child, Jesus said. You can't come in the kingdom of heaven. Folks, we need to understand this is what God has done. That despite the fact that we were at war against God and at war within ourselves, that, that He, that God stepped out of heaven and in His own way, in the fullness of time, Christ came. Christ came. God sent forth His Son that we might be saved. And so, when we come face to face with God's answer that the glory of the Christian Gospel this morning, folks, is the, it is the Gospel of peace. It, it, it otherwise, an, an impossible situation in which we could not save ourselves any more than Naaman, the Syrian general, could heal himself from leprosy. That God came to us. That God made a way despite the fact that we thumbed our nose at God and we had turned our backs on Him. That through Christ, Colossians 1 says, 
to, he came to Christ came to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in your mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. You're going to come face to face with God's answer. You're going to have to come face to face with the bloody cross. You're going to have to come face to face with God the Son coming and dying in your place. You're going to have to come face to face with the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross. You're going to have to come face to face with the fact that you could never and will never by your own volition save yourself. But only by His blood blood of the spotless, righteous Lamb of God, can you be saved? That God desired that there was, that God is the ultimate peacemaker. That there would be peace for all of us who had turned our backs on Him. In 1 Timothy 2, we read these amazing words, for there is one God and there is one mediator, peacemaker, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all. And so in Romans 5.1, we, we go back to Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the third and fourth beatitude, blessed are the meek, those who submit, right? We've been talking about that to Him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. Now made merciful. Now made pure in heart before God that we might see God. And we come face to face then with what this does to our relationships, not only with God, but also with each other. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. This is the human condition. All have turned aside. Therefore, they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And then it describes how that affects the way we treat each other. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are, ship, are, are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace, the way of peace, they have not known. Titus 3.3 3 says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, <coughs> led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. This is the human condition before we come to Christ. But listen to this. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. <laughs> and that, and that kill, he, what did God kill? He killed the hostility between us. Between us and Himself. And now, between us and one another. So, we have turned. We have turned. We are no longer separated from God. No longer do we need to live in hostility and violence toward one another. The One who is the ultimate peacemaker has now called us to peace. So, Romans 14, 19, So let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual peace. Of building. This becomes the pursuit of our lives that we strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we are called to be careful with peace that we, if you want to say it this way, we must fight 
for peace. That it is our calling to fight for peace. That God says in the book of Proverbs, there are seven things, six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him, and the last one that is named a false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. Listen, there's no greater example than this, that there are wheat and tares in the church. Right? You know the story. You don't look it up. That there are wheat and tear. That the, there is no greater example than this. That in, in within the body of Christ, I've done this for a long, long time. There is always someone who just seems bent on sowing discord. And I'm telling you, if you want, if you want to understand what what it's like to, to see a person who's, who's saying, on one hand, I'm a Christian, but on the other the other hand, is a is a child of of people. One who makes war. It's this. There is a constant sowing of discord that's coming forth from your life. Our tendency as Christians, even today, even as believers, is to get up in arms about every slight and every perceived offense. I, I look at social media and I look at, at, at brothers and sisters in Christ on social media and the things that we say to people and say to each other. And, and I'm telling you, it sure doesn't look like a child of God to me. And, 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 here, and you know, don't, don't you know that there are people out there that are baiting you as a Christian? I mean, it's been proven that Russian bots... <laughs> We're, we're, we're put to, you know, all of this process was put to work to sow discord and they targeted Christians. Some of us just sharing everything that comes down the pipe. Whether we've checked it out or looked at it or confirmed it at all because we want to be offended and get offended by everything that comes down the pipe. Don't you know there are news media people out there who are paid to make you mad? Don't you, don't you see? I mean, that's what they, they... They don't get paid if you don't watch. And they know you watch if they can get you all up in arms. And so many of us as believers have fallen right into it. A couple of years ago, there was... Someone was walking through a Costco and they saw a Bible there and on the Bible it was labeled fiction. So they took a picture of it and they started passing it around. On, and look at what Costco is saying here. That the Bible is fiction. This is, this is what's going on in our world. What they came to find out is some kids going through working at Costco labeling things and just didn't stop when he got to the Bible. One Bible! with the label fiction, and we're all ready to, to go to war. And don't you know that people out there are laughing? That, that, look at these Christians who say they are the sons of God. And look at what that means. Folks, we need to be careful with peace. Watch what you do and what you say. You bring derision on the name of Christ. A hot-tempered man, Proverbs says, stirs up strife, but he is slow to anger, quiets contention. Very picturesque word. Pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. Watch what you say. Your tongue, your tongue is a force for good or a force for evil. We need to pray with the psalmist. Set a guard over, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And I want you to understand peace has a price. We have to fight for peace. And the greatest fight is down inside of us. If you want peace in your home and in your marriage, there's always a price. It's going to cost you your self-centeredness, your ego, your selfishness. It's going to cost you. You know, they say, as it's been said, the two most difficult words are, I'm sorry. The three most difficult words, I was wrong. The five most difficult words, I'm sorry I was wrong. The six most difficult words, I'm sorry I was wrong a lot. I'm telling you, how can you expect to have peace in your home 
when you've got war in your heart, we need to let God bring forth from us His peace. James 3, but wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, I don't have time to go into this this morning, but let me just tell you, that doesn't mean we become just mamby-pamby about everything and peace at all costs. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but division. What He's saying is there are two kingdoms pitted against each other here. And there's always going to be a kingdom of darkness until the Lord Jesus comes again. We are not at peace with the world, with the kingdom of darkness. Do you understand? You have been brought to peace in the kingdom of light and with the King. Hallelujah. And live in that peace. So, the next thing, come face to face with how this changes our life purpose. 2 Corinthians 5, we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ministers of reconciliation, every one of us, bringing peace between God and humankind, our, our friends, our neighbors, the people we work with. Jesus said to His disciples, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We are called. This has changed our life purpose. Blessed are the peace makers. Right? It's something you've got to work at. It's something we've got to, to preserve. It's something we've got to be really careful Peace is something we're going to have to fight for in this world. But I want you to know something that's not always going to be that way. We sang a little while ago about we shall all be changed. And I, and I want you to understand they shall be called sons of God. Not only impacts our lives now, we come face to face with a, re a family resemblance. You look in the mirror... And as the Lord has transformed your life, what do you begin to see there? You begin to see Him. Oh, let it be said. When somebody looks at me, He's got His Father's eyes. He's got His Father's eyes. Let it be said of you, there's a family resemblance here. She looks like Him. He looks like you know, when Adam, we read in Genesis, when Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And the New Testament tells us, shows us that we are, before we come to Christ, we are children of Adam. But you know what? When we come to Him, we are no longer children of Adam, but we are children of God. And so we are made and being remade into the image of God. And ultimately, ultimately, you know, those who do not know the Lord, Jesus said, you are of your father the devil, and you will not do what your father desires. He's a murderer, a liar, and all those things, the truth is not in him. We don't, not, not that father, but the father who came, the one who came to make peace between us and himself. I looked, I looked at, at this and I thought about what's coming in the kingdom to come. When the fullness of the kingdom comes. Listen to these words in Revelation 22. And night will be no more. This is what it's going to be like in the new heaven and the new earth. That night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they shall reign forever and ever. But also listen to what Jesus said. Then the righteous, he's talking about in the kingdom to come, will shine like the sun in the kingdom 
of the Father. And then it will truly be said in full sense, He's got His Father to us. She's got her Father to us. Let you know what eternal life is, folks? Eternal life is taking what is to come, God taking what is to come, and bringing it forward into the hearts and lives of people like you and me right now. So that as we live in this world, we become people who look like our Father. Blessed are the peacemakers. I wonder if there's a place in your life right now where there needs to be peace. Maybe it's the peace that needs to be brought inside of you. You realize there's a war going on and, 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 and you need God, you need the hand of God to, 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 bring, to, to bring peace in your life. Perhaps this morning you look at your life and you say, you know what, I've never made peace with God. God came in Jesus Christ that, that something could be done you could never do. In fact, there's no way you can make peace with God but God can make peace with you today. If you will simply submit to the King, to the King who comes to bring peace in your life. Will you come to Christ today? Will you come to Christ? I wonder in your, in your relationships with others as you look around, in, 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 your, in your life right now? Is, it, is there discord? Is there a place in your life where you need the Lord, where, where, where you need the Lord to help you that you can, instead of being a person of discord, bring, that you can be a peacemaker? Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in the place where you work. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. That, you know, I, I got two neighbors right now that are just at odds with each other. I'm just praying, Lord, help me get peace with me. One of them coming to me saying, Hey, Kenny, you know what he did? Then, Kenny, you know what he did? God help me bring peace to be a peacemaker. You know what? There's somebody, I bet you know somebody today who, not know, who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The mission of your life has been changed. And he has called you to be a maker peace. By standing for Christ and speaking the gospel of peace that others may know. Would you be a peaceful? And let's all look forward to the day when there will be no more war. When they will beat their plowshares in, and, and they will beat their spears in the plowshares. And we will forever be with Him in peace. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good to know? Let's go to the Lord right now in prayer. Becky, will you come and just play as we take this time of prayer? We come before the Lord in these moments.